Jahan. Thank you so much for doing this for us today. Been teaching at the center for many years now, as he realized since 2014, maybe. Yeah, 2014, I think. Yeah. Yeah, uh, he's been doing cyanotypes, calotypes, advanced darkroom, and a few of us have taken classes with him, especially Lynn, who went off and running with cyanotype, and Jen Perenia, who went <laughs> off and running with calotype. <laughs> thank you, Julia, <laughs> and uh, thank you, uh, Lynn and Jen, for uh, just uh, being amazing and uh, just going on to do such good stuff. I, I don't know. I, just makes me really happy just because, um, uh, you know, uh, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but, um, you know, teaching at the center has really been uh, a big part of my practice as an artist too. And it's just really gratifying and just, it just makes me really happy to see that, you know, people are, you know, taking some of these techniques and in a lot of ways, like, uh, you know, doing things way better than I have ever done or just doing things I never would have thought of like cough, cough, Jen, you know, um, coloring her calotypes in such beautiful way, uh, in beautiful ways. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. I'll start off just by kind of talking about um, where my beginnings were uh, in the dark room and just in photography in general. Um, so, Way back when, when I was uh, much younger, I don't know, maybe like junior high, uh, eighth grade or so, um, I went to uh, Rome, uh, Italy, uh, with my family. Um, at that time, I had a small digital point-and-shoot camera um, that was given as a gift. Um, and while I was still young, I took photographs of the trip uh, that I was proud of, and I experimented with changing the photo to black and white. Uh, to sepia or any number of like kind of picture presets that were available in the old iPhoto software. Um, if any of you remember that <laughs> back from 2004. Um, so a few years later, uh, I discovered black and white film um, and of course the dark room. Uh, I was taking a class or a couple of classes at my high school. Um, and by the end uh, with those classes under my belt, uh, I was pretty determined to pursue photography um, you know, into college or, or somehow make a career out of it. You know, I, I, I definitely really had, you know, fallen in love with the medium. Um, so these are some of the things that uh, I made uh, back in high school. Um, in general, I did shoot some digital photographs, uh, but I think for the most part, uh, I was kind of in love with the dark room in the beginning. Um, so you know, there was a lot of trial and error. Um, while I do still like these three prints that I'm showing you now, they definitely were, uh, you know, probably happy accidents. Um, I mean, I would, you know, I, I was decent with kind of getting the settings right on the camera, um, but some things were just like totally just like a miracle. Like that one print on the right of the rose, um, the reason the background is so uh, dark is actually because I utterly overexposed the negative and so I kept like you know putting more and more light onto it into the dark room and like eventually I was like oh my god look at that like it, it came out like I can see the you know the separations and the tones and everything and you know the background was nice and dark and I was like ooh, it's like I put it in like a, a studio setup or something like that um, but it's funny when looking at these now because I realized that um, you know, that image in particular is kind of a cool example of what uh, you can do with film that you really, you know, sometimes, you know, you don't necessarily realize that you can do is just, is just how much you can kind of uh, pull from the highlights um, if you, you know, completely overexpose the film. Like, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but in my classes, I always say like, it really is better to just put more light onto the film than less um, because the film's ability to still retain that information as long as you blast it with light, it's just, it's incredible. Like, and with enough perseverance in the darkroom, you know, something really nice will come out. Um, so um, this is a bit of a jump, but uh, going to undergrad, um, I was uh, introduced to uh, kind of a variety of different mediums. Um, I did painting, I did sculpture, printmaking, ceramics. Um, 
that's how kind of the program was structured at Alfred, um, uh, Alfred University, which is where I went. Um, so, but that multidisciplinary pro uh, approach was kind of captivating to me as much as it was frustrating. Um, and I think kind of learning how to deal with the physicality of the mediums kind of fostered a sense of patience. So, um, Physicality is something I kind of come back to a little bit later, but that same sense of patience is sort of what led me to this project, um, which I did in my uh, junior year, uh, I think fall of junior year at Alfred. Um, so with this project, um, I kind of wandered around um, the Alfred town and the countryside. Um, and I did it entirely at night. Um, I was sort of looking for scenes that I kind of felt like were mysterious to me, but that also were sort of like, uh, had some element of like kind of pushing and pulling in the space, you know, maybe there was something striking in the foreground or there was something unusual in the distance. Um, and essentially what I would do is I would set up the camera on the tripod um, and uh, I had a whole bunch of flashlights uh, and they all had uh, colored uh, gels or colored filters uh, you know, taped onto them. And some would kind of be placed uh, just so they'd be illuminating one section for the course of an exposure, but others I would actually sort of paint the scene with. So, you know, if you imagine I'm holding a flashlight right now, I'm kind of moving the flashlight around and I'm basically illuminating a part of the scene over the course of the exposure. Um, so uh, they were usually 15, 30 minutes, um, I might have done an hour exposure once. I can't remember. I might have maybe done a 45 minute one. Um, so that element of patience kind of became an important part of the project. Um, and it was just a really great way for me to explore color because um, I pretty much had kind of, uh, I don't know, I, I guess like under, I undersold myself when I was younger. I was like, you know, oh, I'm, I'm more of the black and white guy. but. Really after this project, I realized how much I loved color and uh, just like how interesting it was to work with it. Um, you know, like warm colors up front, cold colors in the background or reversing that kind of idea. Um, and uh, these are some of my favorites from that project. Um, I think they, for the most part, the ones that are here were kind of part of the, like the final project that was for the class. Um, and I was very fortunate because I printed these in a color darkroom. Um, so there aren't many of these around these days, these darkrooms that are, you know, completely pitch black, there are no safe lights. Um, so you had to basically operate the enlarger in complete darkness. And once you hit expose, you know, you were exposing. Um, dodging and burning was also uh, much harder uh, in this kind of environment too. Um, but it was very satisfying, um, and I was also fortunate enough uh, that Alfred at the time still had an old um, RA4 uh, processing machine. Um, and it basically, this type of paper, chromogenic paper, um, you know, it has silver and color dyes in it. And when you feed it into the RA4 machine, it basically develops and fixes it, you know, all for you. So I didn't have to go through what many have told me is a very laborious and sometimes frustrating process of developing your own color prints. Um, developing color film is not that hard, I think is actually very rewarding. You know, it's a little bit different than black and white film, but, um, but I've heard that color printing development is a little bit of a trickier beast. Um, so this project in a lot of ways was, uh, it kind of fostered uh, an interest in color, it kind of fostered an interest in uh, me just kind of going out uh, into the landscape or into suburbia or even urban environments or, you know, that kind of sort of countryside environment and just sort of being able to wander, um, spend a lot of time and just like, you know, practice patience sort of uh, while I was photographing. Um, so for a little bit of, um, a different project. Um, so these are uh, a collaboration uh, with a friend and artist of mine named Kirsty Reeves. Um, 
They were uh, simultaneously for a lighting class that I took at Alfred, and they were also for my first um, alternative process class, which I took at Alfred too. Um, so uh, basically, they were a way for me to kind of get used to diffusing light um, and getting used to shooting in a studio environment, so using strobes. Um, she would wear an assortment of different fabrics and materials. Um, the idea was sort of loosely based around performance or and slash or transformation. Um, sometime later though, I realized that like as a male photographer making the, like the female subject sort of transform before me was a whole can of worms. Um, and I didn't really find a way to tackle that nuance at the time, um, but you know, all, all that being said, it still was uh, a really, uh, it was a learning experience for me and it was a really engaging project. Um, if you're out there, Kirsty, uh, I don't think you are, I didn't see your name pop up, but if you ever see this, uh, thank you so much again for putting up with uh, all the antics in this project. Um, so uh, yeah, she was a big help. But um, these images I eventually turned into negatives and I then made calotypes out of. Um, so, uh, another person I want to thank is Brian Arnold. Um, he also is not here at this point, but uh, he used to teach at Alfred and he uh, introduced me to the alt processes. Uh, really, I have a lot to thank him for because I really had no idea that these processes existed until I uh, had a class with him. And, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, I'm just immensely grateful. Um, so these are four cal types uh, that I uh, did make from that work uh, and that are in somebody else's home. Um, I one thing I regret is that uh, I didn't document uh, like a lot of the analog or all process prints that I've made over the years as thoroughly as I should have. Uh, if there's any lesson I guess I could give, uh, it's that you really yeah you should document what you do. <laughs> um, but uh, it was a really great kind of introduction to the process and it really kind of got me thinking about this new way of sort of producing work. Um, so moving on, uh, this was, uh, so my senior year at Alfred um, was largely uh, free form. I wasn't necessarily taking uh, any more uh, classes that were kind of centered around one subject. Um, Instead, I kind of had to make my own project, uh, which was, you know, sort of a first for me, I guess, in a way. Um, and I did a couple of different things and I was sort of at a loss uh, as to what to do for a little while. Um, but eventually um, I realized that, you know, I did enjoy sort of kind of going out into the night and photographing. Um, and I did have a knack for getting myself in the places that you know, people wouldn't expect um, or getting to myself in the places that I shouldn't. Um, and so uh, the project that followed was kind of the culmination of uh, many months of going into this um, uh, building that was being constructed on the college campus that was across from mine. So um, it's just like a general FYI. There's Alfred University and then there's Alfred State. Um, one's a private school, one's a SUNY school. Um, they're separated just by a street in the middle. Um, but uh, funny thing about that is that the art school that I went to is actually a SUNY school, but they're just housed in the private side. Um, nevertheless, um, the, uh, the state side was always just really interesting to me, mainly just because I didn't really interact um, with it that much. And I felt like a lot of the architecture and just sort of the landscape of the place was, it was just interesting, you know, it was sort of unknown. Um, and so this building that was being constructed, I would sneak in very late at night. Um, and it was such a strange experience uh, because obviously I was trespassing, um, but it was like really easy to do it. Um, like I really wasn't like cutting barbed wire or anything. So I don't know, that just makes me wonder if anybody else trespassed at any point. Um, and that kind of like lent to the feeling of uh, sometimes paranoia in being there. Um, I dubbed the series Solace. Uh, so in a way the title kind of implies like peace. 
Um, and it definitely was peaceful sort of going through like these very empty halls and spaces and seemingly being the only living thing there. Um, uh, there were some stray cats every once in a while. Um, but at the same time, there was that paranoia, sort of that feeling of like, you know, oh, did I hear that somebody was there, you know, and a lot of times it just ended up being that I was hearing like college students like outside of the thin, you know, plastic walls, you know, talking or going back to their dorms or etc. Um, but uh, I would spend a lot of time in this space and I would sort of wander and I would sort of photograph. I thought about sort of light. Um, I thought about just sort of like uh, my own sort of mental state when I was in there. Um, in some ways, some of these images uh, were kind of um, like, uh, I guess uh, there was like, there were several times where, you know, despite the feeling of like kind of exploration or trepidation, you know, that I was kind of sort of anxious or I was sort of claustrophobic. Um, and so kind of going out into the night air, like after a successful sort of kind of uh, wandering inside was uh, liberating a lot of times. Um, so it, it's, you know, kind of a complicated series for me because um, I was proud of it and ultimately it did sort of become what I presented uh, for my senior show at Alfred. Um, but I felt like there were a lot of things about it that um, I would have liked to have done more with, um, but uh, inevitably uh, it was still, you know, a good experience um, and uh, yeah, it was like a good way to sort of like round out the senior year. Um, so uh, after college, um, I was, uh, my art practice stuttered for a little bit. Um, I was a little depressed, admittedly. Um, you know, just some stuff that had gone on in college and also just like whether or not like I, I wasn't really certain like what I was going to do with my photography or my art practice. Um, but, you know, I would hang out with friends um, and I would take pictures here and there. Um, I would also walk a lot, um, sometimes during the day and sometimes at night. Um, most of the time I wasn't photographing. I was just walking, um, but it kind of filled me with a lot of inspiration uh, and a sort of newfound appreciation for Lake Ontario and sort of the surrounding area uh, because uh, my parents' home was uh, or was and still is uh, in that Irondequoit area around Lake Ontario. Um, one very cold and snowy night, um, a good friend of mine, uh, he drove us out to uh, the lake basically, and the lake had completely frozen over just because of how cold and how frozen it was. Um, and uh, we went out onto the ice in order to get this photo. Um, uh, it took a good 15 to 20 minutes of exposure. Uh, it, it definitely wasn't the safest thing I've done. Um, probably wasn't the safest thing I should have done, but, um, but we made it out okay. And uh, honestly, I'm really damn happy that I did, uh, you know, uh, it was probably still is one of my favorite photographs that I've taken. Um, the orange light is the result of, uh, you know, during the winter you get like such thick clouds and all the light from the city sort of bounces around in that. And if you do a long exposure, it sort of kind of blooms and it can be pretty luminous uh, compared to how it looks like with just your eyes when you're out there yourself. Um, so, Bit by bit, um, inspiration did hit me. Um, this series was kind of a loose collaboration with uh, my very talented father. Um, so he has a mastery of uh, ceramics and the ceramic form, but you know, uh, with that mastery comes uh, seconds. So you know, pieces that you know they might exhibit some flaw. Uh, and for whatever reason, you know, he, he doesn't want to sell them or maybe he'll just like give them as like a, a free gift or something like that. But um, anyways, graciously, he let me use them along with some that definitely were not seconds. Um, and uh, I kind of made these uh, abstract still lives with them. Um, I still didn't have a lighting studio, um, but I didn't want that to stop me. So 
I made a, uh, a very, like basically out of a very large box, I painted the inside black um, and uh, I placed uh, those same flashlights again um, in sort of different parts of the scene. Uh, and I would do the, uh, the painting with the flashlights that I was sort of talking about with the other project. And over the course of, you know, a longer exposure, not quite like, you know, 10 minutes or anything, but just like maybe a minute or so, you know, you'd still get these really interesting illuminated forms. Um, and uh, they were, um, uh, it was a way for me to kind of like look at his vessels as sort of like abstract objects and also to just sort of think about light, um, to think about uh, what I could do um, with light and kind of, uh, um, it also was a great way to get me back into the dark room because uh, these are all gelatin silver prints. Um, they get their color from a combination of selenium and T-toning, sometimes just T-toning, sometimes just selenium. Um, and just help me kind of continue to improve in the dark room and, uh, you know, kind of explore um, different types of imagery and different type of paper. Uh, the paper was introduced to me in undergrad uh, by a peer of mine. Um, and I've uh, gone on to use it for a lot of projects. It's called Ilford R300. Um, and it's just uh, really lovely stuff. Honestly, the scans of these don't really do them that much justice because uh, they just have such a nice look when you're just kind of holding it in your hands and the light is just being reflected back at you. Uh, because these are actually, they're scanned from the actual prints. Um, so uh, at some point around this time, I got an opportunity to teach alternative processes uh, uh, or an alternative process class at what was the Genesee Center for the Arts and Education, obviously now Flower City Arts. Um, so my first class was super mishmashed. Uh, it was uh, combining cyanotype, Van Dyke Brown, and Cal type processes in way too short a time frame. Uh, I don't know what, what the time frame was. Maybe Jen can remember because I think she was in the class. Um, but I think we only had two days at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It was, it was super short. I feel like the class was just like, I don't know, like six weeks, three processes in six weeks, or, or not six weeks, three processes in just six classes uh, once every week. Uh, but uh, anyways, I learned what not to do. Um, there were a lot of mistakes that I made. Um, I really did have a good sense of time, obviously, uh, and I didn't have nearly as much expertise uh, in the processes as I do now. Um, but you know, despite the shortcomings, uh, I was determined to improve. Um, getting ready to teach a class uh, sort of became motivating for my art practice. Uh, and it became really exciting to see the students' prints, um, to sort of see uh, what they were making, what ideas they had. Um, and I was just like really proud that I could foster an enriched community of you know, creative individuals. Like, uh, I loved it. Um, and obviously I, I kept teaching. So it, you know, it ended up working out like that. Um, so uh, in 2016, uh, I was working uh, at Rochester General Hospital. My schedule fluctuated. Um, and when I worked an evening shift, I would get out pretty late. Um, so I would drive back home um, and maybe I might get some fast food or something. Um, I drive down the, a much quieter version of Ridge Road um, if anybody knows Ridge Road, you know, it's kind of a big restaurant and, you know, sort of like business uh, sprawl, basically. It's kind of at that like, um, that like intersection between like urban and suburbia. Um, but there was something really peaceful, uh, something really beautiful about exploring the territory at night. Um, so I kind of gathered up my tripod, um, my Nikon F3 camera, and uh, I would wander this sort of like confluence of territory. Um, and I photographed throughout the year. Um, and there were some adventures in the city as well, um, focusing on details um, that you would otherwise miss during the light of day, but also just sort of the bustle of day. Um, you know, obviously you'd be much more conspicuous during the daytime, just kind of uh, pointing the camera at the ground, for example, or, you know, spending a lot of time by your camera. 
Um, and uh, it was sort of a, a meditative project for me. Um, and uh, overall, uh, I made some of my uh, proudest black and white prints from this project. Um, so in the fall of 2016, I presented uh, the, the gelatin silver prints with uh, Mark Watts uh, and Chris Holmquist um, at a show uh, at the center. Um, uh, we proposed a couple of titles, but we settled on Under Safe Light. Uh, and regrettably, I don't have many of the prints scanned, uh, but if there is time, uh, you know, after I go through the slides and the rest of my spiel, um, I could show some of them via the webcam. Um, they might be a little dark, but maybe, maybe they'll brighten up a little bit. Maybe the camera will adjust, I'm not sure. Uh, but that's like a, a project I definitely need to get to at some point is uh, finish scanning more of the prints. You can see a couple more of them in that picture on the right there. Um, We're still waiting for the book, John. Oh, yeah, the book. That's right. Yeah. So <laughs> at one point I said I was going to make a blurb book or something. And oh, man, that didn't happen. So yeah, obviously I got a lot of stuff on the back burner I got to do. Um, I think I promised I was going to get Jenna book. But uh, <laughs> um so in 27, uh, 2017, my life and my art practice, I feel like it, it just got a lot more exciting. Um, so uh, I met my uh, wonderful and beautiful girlfriend, Michelle. Um, I finally started to teach uh, alternative processes better, uh, in my opinion, right? or at least my classes started to reach like a, um, uh, <laughs> a much more cohesive uh, kind of structure. Um, and part of this was also just because I spent a lot more time with the cyanotype and calotype processes. Um, I made a lot of cyanotypes. Um, and uh, it really just helped me kind of get a sense of what I could do with the process. Um, I definitely made some more calotypes too. Um, but ultimately, um, uh, I feel like I, yeah, I probably spent more time with the cyanotypes. But um, I did get noticed that I was uh, accepted at uh, Visual Studies Workshop. Um, uh, they have a graduate program there through SUNY Brockport. Um, and I was really excited about that because uh, I thought I could finally, you know, just like take my practice as an artist in like an interesting new direction. Um, so the summer prior, made lots of cyanotypes, uh, you know, really uh, kind of explored the color possibilities, the toning possibilities, and kind of got a better sense of sort of the chemical sort of uh, mutability of the process. Um, and even to this day, I'm still learning. So uh, still learning, still learning. Um, so uh, enter VSW. So um, I kind of took the stuff that I learned over the summer with practicing with the process, as well as sort of my own experiments uh, in that first semester, and it definitely reflected in some of the stuff that I made. Um, so the idea here was to kind of make a play space, um, to make something that was a little bit more uh, interactive. So. These are three uh, 30 by 22 uh, pieces of paper that are coated with cyanotype solution. Um, I nailed uh, lemons and tangerines into the paper. Um, so I had a very nice smell. Um, and uh, the idea was sort of the foster play um, and uh, people could um, assault the surface if they wanted um, with uh, spritz bottles that would um, sort of blast off uh, a alkaline solution. And uh, so it was a way of like taking like the chemical aspects of the process, um, you know, basically cyanotype water and acidity are good. Uh, they help develop it and they basically leave behind uh, ferric ferrocyanide, which is Prussian blue, which is that wonderful blue pigment that everybody sort of like recognizes the process by um, and it's very stable. Um, but it has one weakness, mainly alkalinity, which is like the opposite of acidity, you know, kind of like soapiness uh, in a way. And if you mixed sodium carbonate with the water, which is just washing soda, which you can, you know, buy at a grocery store, um, that would bleach the surface and leave behind a yellow pigment, which is this other iron compound. Um, so this kind of interplay between the two was interesting and it was nice because I didn't really know what was going to happen. Um, you know, 
For example, if somebody spritz the surface with the alkaline stuff, but then squeeze the tangerine, that tangerine would sort of cancel out what was happening with the surface, but colors would change, you know, textures would change. Um, there was, there was an indeterminateness to it, which I thought was really exciting. Um, so uh, I continued working with the process kind of at VSW. Um, one uh, semester, I was sort of um, trying to figure out like uh, what sort of uh, imagery I was sort of interested in at the time. And um, I kind of became, uh, NASA has this, uh, you know, public domain where they have all these great images that are taken by the Hubble or various other sort of telescopes or types of images that are sort of composited together. And I thought about like, oh man, you know, what if I just like make cyanotypes of these celestial bodies? And um, I used a, uh, a thinner paper for this. Um, and as a result, when I sort of combined these 48, uh, eight and a half by 11 prints together, um, when I, they sort of formed a tapestry and when you would put them in front of window light, all the brush strokes and all the imperfections, they would be kind of made visible. Um, and so it was a project that was sort of talking about light and was sort of talking about color, but um, it was also just sort of talking about how like the process itself, um, you know, can be presented in so many different ways. And, you know, the idea of like a test print or something that might necessarily be unwanted, you know, doesn't necessarily need to uh, be like a dead end. Like mistakes can glean possibilities. Um, another thing I discovered with this was that um, paper is just so durable as is the process. And like you could do multiple different exposures, multiple wash cycles, and you could just get such varied and interesting chemical results. Um, so, um, so yeah, this was a, a interesting project. Um, so uh, kind of shifting gears a little bit. Um, I actually, I did this project before the one I just showed, but um, I, the calotype process is more sensitive than the uh, cyanotype process. And one day, I don't even know, I feel like I was just sitting in the studio in the dark uh, at BSW and I was trying to think about uh, what to do for a specific assignment or uh, sort of project. And I realized I was like, wait, like, you know, I've inverted my phone before in order to kind of see negatives on a light table, like film negatives in their positive form to kind of get a quick preview. What if I just invert my phone and place it on some sensitized paper? And I knew, I sort of intuitively knew that the cyanotype wouldn't work because of literature that I had read that really strongly indicated that you needed UV light. But, you know, the phones are made of, a, of an RGB, uh, you know, LED matrix basically. And um, that blue LED is pretty blue. And um, the calotype process is actually sensitive to blue light. So what I did is I basically just, you know, modified it a little bit. Um, you know, I think I, Bostic and Sullivan, um, had, which was one of the suppliers for uh, calotype chemistry, they had like a 12% solution of silver nitrate instead of a 10%. I was like, oh, a little bit more silver nitrate, probably a little bit more sensitive. And I just used that with the regular calotype uh, chemistry and I inverted the phone and I placed it on top of the paper and you gotta leave it there for a while, you know, which is a weird thing in itself. Your phone completely at max brightness, just sitting, not doing anything, but exposing a piece of paper. But sure enough, it does yield an image. Um, and uh, I published a, a tutorial online um, on this site called Instructables. Um, you can see the tutorial on my website if you're interested. Um, but uh, it was really cool just to see that it worked. Uh, the tutorial uh, got a lot of good attention. Um, and the funny thing about this is that um, it honestly would work with gelatin silver paper too. But if anybody knows any software engineers out there, we gotta find somebody that will essentially create an app that the, the phone will turn on only for a second and then turn off again. Um, because otherwise, you know, just based on how sensitive gelatin silver paper is, you'll get like all sorts of light or fogging or 
you know, it won't be as super clean as it was with this. Um, you know, the cal type is sensitive, but it's not so sensitive that you have to work in complete darkness. So you have some room to kind of uh, mess around a little bit. Um, so uh, I think this was last year. Um, I uh, was kind of thinking about the cyanotype process again and just how much I sort of end up reusing. Um, this whole idea of sort of reusability and of sort of like uh, putting the paper through multiple wash cycles uh, made me think about washing clothes and sort of like how many times we wash clothes. Um, so I made this project where essentially um, I made uh, cyanotype prints of my own clothes, um, but I wanted to kind of reference the origin of the process while sort of like comically making that connection um, to washing clothes itself. So what I did is I actually, um, I started experimenting with resin uh, uh, and ended up being really fulfilling, really rewarding. Um, the resin, as long as you um, kind of like position the tray and let the resin set, you kind of build layer by layer, you can sort of make it look as if water is sort of swishing along in the tray. Um, and uh, what I would do is I would have the initial print um, that sort of had like a depiction of my clothes on it, but um, I also sometimes would cut out other little bits of prints that also had clothes on them and I would sort of suspend them on a different level. So the one on the right and the one in the middle, um, you know, that pair of uh, shorts or boxers uh, is much higher um, than the print itself at the bottom. Uh, and the socks uh, are, you know, much higher than the print at the bottom and the middle one. Um, so interspersed in the tray, there are also a couple of pieces of lint um, and some hair sort of like that comes from my washing machine, basically. And again, it was a way for me to think about how like photographic process is, it's a lot about water and it's a lot about like what's washing away with the water. And so the resin was sort of a way to kind of like reference the origin of the, of the process in the tray, but also to suspend it, to kind of freeze frame it and think about like, oh, like that's in the water, you know, you know, but where's that water going? Um, and uh, that same sort of thought process is um, kind of what is uh, leading me to my thesis uh, at VSW. Um, uh, the coronavirus sort of like, uh, you know, put a bit of a damper on a couple of different things, but I've been doing a lot of different reading, um, you know, kind of interested in Kodak and sort of various things that uh, they did over the years. I'm interested in the Genesee River um, in the same way that sort of like things in these trays kind of settle to the bottom or are suspended at the bottom of the resin. Um, Jeremy Mule, who you guys uh, may all know, a uh, really great uh, printer and Avid Darker member, um, you know, he uh, shared with me some reportage about just like how finally like uh, some legal matters have been solved and Kodak Business Park is at least going to start to get cleaned and Kodak Business Park is right by the Genesee River. There's all these stories about the Genesee River, including that there's like basically a layer of like sediment, and like metal at the bottom of the river. <laughs> so I'm like thinking about like sort of photographic process and sort of like the consequence of photographic process. Um, so, but quarantine wasn't all doom and gloom. Um, I, well, I took a workshop at BSW uh, last summer and it actually was a workshop that was primarily focused on cyanotype uh, by a very talented Buffalo artist named John Opera. But there was another artist who took that workshop who um, introduced uh, the lumen print process to me. And I tried it out a couple times during that workshop, but I was sort of focused on a couple of other things that were happening you know, in the workshop or certain ideas that I had then. Um, and so I didn't really give it like a fair shot. Um, now, you know, uh, stuck at home and, you know, what do I do? I can't be in a dark room and I don't have a printer, so I can't make um, negatives to kind of contact print, then make cyanotypes or calotypes. 
I realized that the lumen print process was a really great area of creativity. Um, and all you need is um, uh, old expired gelatin silver paper. So don't toss your gelatin silver paper because the older it is, the more expired it is, the more interesting the results are going to be. And you can always get results no matter how old it is. Um, uh, these three here are really nice. Um, the paper wasn't too old. It was just Ilford R300 that was a, like, I don't know, like maybe four years old or something like that. But um, I was able to get some, uh, some old Kodak paper from VSW and I don't have those scanned yet, but I mean, they work beautifully. And that paper is like two decades old or something like that. Um, so it's a really fascinating process. Um, the way it works is that uh, you don't develop the prints. Um, they literally are exposed to an extreme level by sunshine, basically. And what gives these beautiful colors is that the silver um, that's in the prints um, is uh, a colloid. So basically it's like uh, the silver particles are like suspended in the gelatin. And because of the intense exposure that's um, given by the sun, a certain reaction happens and essentially beautiful color is scattered in the silver particles. So it's not a result of pigment. It's basically just light that's sort of being scattered and, um, you know, kind of reflected back to you, basically, uh, which is just really interesting. Um, now, it's tricky, though, because you do need to fix the process in order for it to be light permanent. Um, these aren't fixed yet. When they do get fixed, and I've fixed the uh, uh, one or two so far, um, they get a lot lighter. And some of the beautiful colors, unfortunately, disappear. But there are ways to circumvent this. Um, I mean, one, you can scan them before you uh, fix them. But the other thing is that um, if you work with a couple of other different chemical compounds that I'm still trying to figure out right now as we speak, you can help preserve some of the colors. Um, and uh, before the whole coronavirus thing, or even in the beginning of when it was gonna happen, I was gonna contact Bill Bates, who you guys may have heard of as well. Um, and uh, he was uh, gonna generously give me some gold toner because apparently gold actually helps make the, the silver colloid sort of transform into something else. Then when you fix it, the colors sort of stay. Um, so that's something that I'm excited to try. And uh, I'm not sure where this work will sort of take me, but um, it's been very gratifying. And uh, there's something very satisfying about using paper that was otherwise deemed worthless or paper that I didn't necessarily have a use for anymore because I don't have access to a darkroom right now. And I just think that there's something really nice about that. You know, the fact that like all this stuff, all this silver, all this stuff that was made by these companies, there's still a use for it. You know, you just kind of have to think outside the box a little bit in order to, in order to get that. So, but uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's what I got. So uh, thank you everybody. <laughs> thank you so much. That was, that was, I'm blown away. I had oh, <laughs> Thanks, Juliana. Really awesome. Uh, I'll open it up to questions since we have about 10 minutes left. Does anyone have questions? Hey, Jen. <laughs> so my question is, what does the resin that you used for that one project actually do to the paper, like long term? Like, does it, you know how if you keep your cyanotypes out exposed to the light for a really long time, like they will eventually lighten up a little bit. And, you know, we had mm -hmm. talked during the class about how you can do other things to sort of brighten them back up. But I wonder if like the resin acts like a protective layer. It might, you know, it's kind of uncharted territory for me. Yeah. Um, the only thing I've noticed so far is that on one of them, the resin started to yellow a little bit. Um, I don't know if that's the cyanotype interacting with it or if that's just because I didn't mix the resin as well as I should have. I feel like on one of them, the resin still looks pretty clear, um, but it will be really interesting to see what happens to them over time. Um, by the way, uh, you inadvertently brought it up, but the whole like um, when cyanotypes kind of potentially get lighter when they're hit by light. So I finally got good documentation on this. Um, there's a chemist um, and a chemist slash artist. He's more of a chemist really, but um, really great guy named Mike Ware. 
And I had heard of him before, but I finally checked out his website. And as luck would have it, uh, effective January of 2020, he has made um, public and free to download um, this very comprehensive book called the Cyanomicon. Cyanom Cyanomicon. And it's like, you know, years and years of research on the history of the process and on the chemical sort of nature of the process. Um, what it can do, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's very comprehensive. I will say um, the beginning and sort of the beginning middle is really good. It gets a, maybe a little, uh, I don't know, it gets a little dense in like the middle, the late middle. Um, I haven't read all of it yet. Uh, and I don't know if I actually will read all of it because it's really big. But what's really interesting is that the cyanotype process, this is one strange process because if it's exposed to light, a chemical reaction happens and you get what's called Prussian white on top. But if you put the process, if you put the print into darkness, then that energizing that happened by the light settles and the Prussian white, it can't, it can't maintain itself and it actually just transforms back into Prussian blue, ferric ferrocyanide. <laughs> And so I had heard about this before that like if you put cyanotypes in the dark for like a month or so that they return to their former glory, but it actually is true apparently like, and you know, if I was much more of a chemist, I'd better be able to explain this. But uh, yeah, definitely check out that, uh, that book if you're interested. Um, you know, you spell where is it just W A R E? Uh, like M I K E W A R E. Yep. Okay. Like where. okay. So. So I want to go back to like in, in your very, very early work when you were photographing your friend and you talked about how like photographing the female figure opened up a can of worms for you. Can you expand on that a little bit and how you, what all that meant? <laughs> well, I had a friend in college who was really obsessed with um, this idea of, um, there's a film, uh, I think it's called like blow up or something. Um, and it's about like uh, this, you know, like what 1970s, you know, photographer, sort of like this like masculine ideal of what a, a photographer is basically and how like um, models are essentially just sort of like submitting to him as he's like getting these photographs and like getting the ultimate shot, the ultimate capture or something. And I'm sure, I never watched the film all the way through. Um, I'm sure the film has uh, a little bit more to it than just that. Like it seemed like the character himself was a little troubled. Um, but um, it's just like that sort of idea that uh, I feel like I didn't really handle with quite as much nuance, which is the idea that, um, you know, while I am collaborating with um, a female artist, I'm kind of like subjecting her to what I want her to wear which I feel like could have been something that would have been really interesting if I at the time had kind of looked at that a little bit more broadly and like kind of made commentary on it. But the work that I was making at the time back then, it honestly just ended up being much more of like a technical exercise, I feel like for the both of us. And it was just like cool to see that, oh, the lighting looks so good or, you know, like, or, oh, like you look so dramatic or something like that. Um, but a lot of the sort of um, like the the dynamic or like the social connotations really weren't touched on at all. Um, so interesting. There's the whole thing about the male gaze and all that. Right. Yeah. When you entered VSW, like the slide, the I think the slide before that was your um, photographs of the second ceramic pieces, which were. Yep. Absol like absolutely gorgeous, of course. And then BSW and it's like, like all of a sudden you're nailing lemons <laughs> and tangerines. <laughs> and like there's all this control and very preciseness, just Yeah. I, a lot of yeah, a lot of precision out the window, yeah. <laughs> um yeah, I just this was part of the um, I feel like uh in undergrad I was sort of working to be very precise. I feel like a lot of the work I was doing was kind of like a, around that sort of like loose idea of precision. 
um, loose idea, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, it was just really liberating just being able to experiment. Um, I would really, like, I would really say, like, if, um, if you're somebody who um, has spent a lot of time with photography, but you s are kind of tired of just making, um, you know, just like two dimensional photographs, basically, especially if, you know, you've only, if you've only been making like, let's say digital prints, um, or, or even just like gelatin silver prints, like, it's just really refreshing when you start to kind of think about like the physicality of photography. So like, like what things like react with photographs, like what can photographs be on, you know, like, and what necessarily is a photograph, you know, like is a photograph a coated piece of cyanotype paper with lemons and tangerines on it. Um, <laughs> and that sort of like experimentation, uh, I feel like was just like, just so nice because Alfred University, um, it was a good program to be sure, but it definitely was a little bit more classic uh, in sort of how it approached photography. And, um, you know, BSW does a, a variety of different things. I mean, they're definitely, uh, you know, uh, they're focused on a lot, but I mean, as a program, they really do lend to that feeling of experimentation, so. Yes, which I absolutely love. Yeah. Um, so this lumen printing process, do you think that uh, eventually that will become a workshop that you teach as well? <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. It's tricky because um, it takes a long time. I haven't quite figured out, um, like, uh, I haven't really measured like uh, the amount of exposure that's needed. Um, you know, I mean, again, this kind of goes with some of the looseness I've been doing when I'm approaching it is that a lot of times I just leave them out there for a whole day. Um, and that's just based on some information that I read online, basically saying that, you know, the more exposure, the better, you know, don't pull them too soon, you know, really let them bake in the sun. Um, but it's such an interesting process and it's, it's like very underground in a lot of ways because, I mean, there for all I know, maybe somebody published a book already, but if you type in the process on Google, you know, and you kind of peruse the websites and et cetera, like there's really nothing like, nobody's really like comprehensively kind of been like, okay, this is what you can do and this is, we'll do that, da, 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 da. Like it's kind of new territory for pretty much every single person who seems to write about it. Um, you know, uh, Bill Bates really likes this guy named uh, Wolfgang Mersch or Morsch. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing Mersch. it right. Mersch? Mersch. Mersch. Okay. So he's a German uh, photographer, artist, and also I probably could say chemist. Um, he sells um, actual chemistry on his website, uh, but he has a flicker. Uh, I know that that long lost website, does anybody do it? <laughs> but uh, you can go to his Flickr and he has some gorgeous lumen prints and he definitely seems to know what he's doing. But what's so funny about this process is that you look through all of his lumens and I think some of them are scanned before he actually fixes them. But even the lumens that I made, just like that I presented in this presentation, like some of the ways that they, like the way that they look, I'm like, Wow, and these don't even actually look like some of Wolfgang's, uh, particularly the one of the hydrangea. So it really is a process where it's just like, like everybody go to town, like find whatever you can. Like, you know, I saw Kitty uh, was experimenting with the process and I was like, oh, that's awesome. Like I want to experiment it with it too. So. Um, yes, I was going to mention her as well. I don't know if she's still with us, but yeah, she, she was doing that. Where she was I think she was laying on them. It was she's there, uh, but she's muted. I'm muted. Oh, no, I'm oh there you are. <laughs> yeah, last summer I spent a lot of time laying in my yard on top of photo paper. Yeah. And my neighbors thought I was like sleeping or passing. <laughs> <laughs> but um I I found some paper from the nineteen fifties. So oh. and it was uh, I think it was Ectolore. But they do look one way before you, you fix them. Yeah, they look. So I've been trying to document the process, and I know you were saying you felt like you needed to document your process more yep. Do it with this because yeah. right now I did it. I did an overnight thing on the pink moon with seventy lumen prints in my yard, and I've photographed them, I've scanned them, and I still haven't fixed them. 
Oh man. <laughs> I know. I, I know that feeling though. Cause like, I really, as soon as you fix them, they're going to be like, Oh man, they might really change. So yeah, we yeah. should share some artists and stuff. And also Michael Latragna who works at the flower city art center or was volunteering. Um, he's going to be at BSW in the fall, and that's what his BFA thesis was on. We're doing an artist talk on June 21st. So. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, check that out, Jonathan. Yeah, you guys yeah. tear it up. Yeah, he. I started some stuff at, with Lumen Prints based on a workshop last year at the Eastman Museum and then introduced it to all my classes, and then people just ran with it. It's fun. Yeah, it's so much fun. Have your students gone back to you about the the work that they've made with it? Like, have you seen some of their? I don't, I don't know that anybody's because they don't have access to chemistry. Oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah, true. But yeah, but a lot of times what they do is they make the exposure and then they scan them and then they mm -hmm. can make some alterations in Photoshop. So there's right. just multiple iterations, which is kind of cool. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, if they keep them in a dark box, I think they'll stay, basically. That's um, what I do. Yeah, good. <laughs> good, good, good. This is a great oh. talk. Yeah. Thank you, John. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, thanks John. This was a lot of thank fun. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.